All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so both to the people in the room and, and people online. Um, as most of you probably know, my name is Jamie McKenzie. I'm the chair of the uh, SA chapter of the Australasian College of Road Safety. Thank you so much for coming along to the second session of the year for uh, um, our lunchtime seminars um, and a very important session at that. Um, probably why we've got such a great turnout. So welcome. Uh, before we get into things, just a little bit of housekeeping for those in the room that might not know if you need to get to the toilets. So out the door back into the sort of atrium area and then down the hallway. Um, if you're coming out of the left to the right um, and toilets are down there. Um, the session is being broadcast as a webinar um, and, and it will be recorded as well. So please, if you have others that you think might be interested, you can pass on to them afterwards. Um, and for those of you that are online, um, please feel free to send in questions using the Q&A function and we'll be able to pass those on at the end and get you some answers. A um, couple of quick updates from the college. Uh, there is a currently a call for nominations for the ACRS Executive Council. Um, those are open until April 21st. So if you are that way inclined and, and, and a member of the college, please, please get those applications in. Leading on from that, the college AGM will be held on May the 25th, uh, where voting will occur for those positions. Um, so again, please try and keep that date free if you're a member um, so that you can be involved in the voting. Uh, a reminder to most of you in the room that be involved in road safety, that Road Safety Week this year will be happening from the 14th to the 21st of May. So there's a whole bunch of activities planned, obviously, um, and probably encourage you to get involved with that. Uh, and finally, the annual uh, Australasian College of Road Safety Conference, sorry, Australasian Road Safety Conference. This year it's being held in Cairns with registrations opening soon. Um, it's going to be a hybrid conference again, so if you can't make it over there, please uh, think about joining virtually. Um, and with that, um, I will introduce our speaker for today. So Sarah Clark is Director of Road Safety Policy Research at the South Australian Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Sarah is responsible for leading the development and implementation of road safety strategy in SA in consultation with key stakeholders, as well as overseeing other initiatives to improve road safety through regulatory settings, decision making and to enhance mobility through technology, innovation and research, enabling equity, access and choice. Over her 15 year career, Sarah has worked in public policy and strategy across the environment, justice and transport portfolios for various state and Commonwealth agencies. Over to you, Sarah, and I will get your slides sorted out. So. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, got it. Sorry. Yep, there you go. There we go. Um, well, yes, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, thanks, Jamie, for the intro and to the SA chapter of the college for hosting today's event. Um, as you mentioned, my name's Sarah Clark. I'm the Director of Road Safety Policy and Research here at the Department for Infrastructure and Transport. Um, and here today to provide an overview of the road safety strategy and the recently released road safety action plan. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the land we meet on today um, and recognise their continuing connection to land and waters. Um, we pay our respects to the diversity of cultures, significance of contributions and to elders past, present and emerging. So in terms of today's session, as I mentioned, I will be giving an overview of the road safety strategy at a high level and then focusing in a bit more detail on the recently released action plan. Um, I'll stop along the way um, to ask questions if that doesn't break the rules of the session. Um, and then there will be some time for questions at the end. Okay, so the road safety strategy um, was released um uh, in january 2022 yep just got a message that they can't see the slides online ah okay we'll just pause for a sec working yes yeah all right 
We're good. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't be a meeting without having a bit yeah. of teams troubleshooting along the way. OK, so in terms of the road safety strategy, it was released in early January 2022. And it provides a, an overall framework for the a whole of government response to road safety and improving road safety outcomes. Um, so, uh, and replaces the previous towards zero strategy. In terms of the overall framework, um, the strategy comprises a monitoring and evaluation framework, and that's about making sure that what we're doing works to improve road safety outcomes. A vision, so that's, um, I guess, the, the South Australian government's commitment to zero lives lost and serious injuries by 2050, um, adopting the vision that's set under the National Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, targets to achieve in terms of reductions in lives lost and serious injuries. Principles to underpin decision making by state government agencies um, around both investment and day to day decision making to help improve road safety outcomes and nine strategic focus areas, um, which I'll come to in a bit more detail in a moment. In terms of the way the strategy is set up, it's, it's structured around key priorities. So they're long term priorities to work towards. What sits alongside that is an action plan. Or the, I guess the crunchy bits in terms of the practical things that state government agencies are actually doing um, and will be doing over the next three years to improve road safety outcomes. So in terms of the nine strategic focus areas, um, those these are road user behaviour, Aboriginal road safety, vehicles, older road users, roads, walking, cycling and public transport, regional and remote areas, young drivers and riders and workplaces. Um, and while what sits behind that is safe systems, um, the way it's been articulated in the strategy is intended to um, focus around when you look at things through a safe system lens, what are particular areas of focus applicable in a South Australian context? Um, I'm conscious that I think last time I presented at one of these sessions, um, it was very much focused around the outcomes of the consultation on the road safety strategy. So um, these focus areas is reflected under each of them were identified following both um, an extensive evidence-based analysis around road safety statistics, but also broad ranging consultation with the community and with road safety stakeholders. Um, so in, in while also just briefly touching on some of the changes that we made in response to community feedback between the consultation draft that I know many of many people saw and provided feedback on and, and that final strategy released early last year. Uh, so some of those key changes were around child restraints and driveway safety uh, in terms of making that a stronger focus. Um, motorcycling and particularly more clearly identifying the need for a view of rider training. Um, Aboriginal road safety. Um, and the other thing that came out was a need for us to be clearer around um, sort of our focus on collaboration, partnerships and innovation and movement into place as principles for decision making. So that that came through in some feedback from key stakeholders. And it's also one of the things that really um, has un underpins the national strategy. So trying to think about what that means in a South Australian context. Um, the other key changes were around heavy vehicle licensing pathways. So there's some work um, going on nationally at the moment that the department's heavily involved in around looking at um, heavy vehicle driver licensing competencies um, and the pathways to progress to a heavier class of license um, and also level crossings. So um, there is work underway at the moment to develop a state level crossing strategy. Um, and I guess including it here is recognises that interaction between the rail and the road interface and the importance of that. Um, and finally, personal mobility devices was something that was included in, in the final version of the strategy um, and has been a real area of focus in recent times, both in terms of the media and some work that the department's just launched in terms of a consultation process. Before I move on to the action plan, I might just pause to see if there's any questions around the strategy. Or, or say strategic focus areas. We got regional and remote areas. 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. So in terms of the strategy, it particularly focused on um, regional roads because of that disparity in road safety outcomes um, between retro regional and metropolitan, um, which is why it was given particular emphasis. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't actions relevant to um, the metropolitan area. Um, so you'll see when I go to talk about the action plan, um, communities, um, local places and schools is a real area of focus. And that, of course, is highly applicable for the metropolitan area. Oh, yes. Okay. Are you having to see the question or do I? Don't... Oh, here we go. Oh, I can see it here. How do I make this big? Rob? Rob wants to, yeah. Rob wants to go live. Okay. He does. There we go. How do I do that? While we're doing that, I might just, we'll come back to you, Rob. I'll just take the question in the room while we're navigating Pete. Good idea. Yep. Um, where's speed management to this phone? Headline or is it transcends across all all aspects. Um, there are some specific speed related actions in the road safety action plan, um, and I'll, I'll come to those in a minute if you like. Uh, okay, I will let me. We got Rob. Allow you to speak, Rob. There you go. You should be able to talk if you unmute. Okay, can Rob. you hear? Sarah can hear you. I can hear you, in, and we can tell the rest in, of the room. Yep. Enforcement has not been highlighted. How, why? Uh, in terms of um, enforcement, um, so I think that comes through under one of the focus areas is road user behaviour. Okay. So that picks up both law enforcement activities um, as well as education and, communi and communication around road safety. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Any other questions on the strategy before we move on to the action plan? Okay, we'll keep going. So following the release of the strategy, um, there was then work done to finalise a road safety action plan um, to operationalise the strategy in terms of key actions that we'll be doing over the next three years. Um, and that action plan was released in February this year. Um, it is released at a time that it's quite um, timely in the sense that Road toll is very much front of mind um, for many people at the moment, um, given the start to the year that we've had. Um, so I think lives lost are around 50% higher than the five year average so far this year, and serious injuries are 30% higher. Um, having said that, I think, particularly reflecting on it personally, it probably feels particularly bad given last year was the best year on record. So it was actually the lowest year in terms of lives lost since records first began. Um, so this action plan was, um, was released earlier this year. Um, and what it does, it sets out cross-government actions. So not just for DIT and SAPOL, but for other agencies as well. Um, Safe Work SA being an example and the Office for Aging Well. So it is a rolling three-year action plan. And what we mean by rolling is that it will get updated each year. Um, we're looking to do our first update mid-2024. So it'll be updated on financial years to align with the state budget cycle. Um, and the idea of that is that it can be updated to respond to new and emerging issues. So I think I touched on the monitoring and evaluation framework before. So if something's highlighted as being an issue through that monitoring and evaluation, um, that, that then prompts us to go, OK, we need to think about what else we need to be doing. Um, the other thing to mention um, is that a progress report will be published annually. Um, so as well as um, having a state based report, we'll also be reporting nationally. So with the release of the National Action Plan late last year, um, that also puts in place some, some reporting requirements for all state and territory governments in Australia. Um, and SA, like everyone else, will be reporting upwards um, federally, um, which we see as being a really positive step in terms of making sure that there's awareness um, nationally around road safety and what's working and what's not. 
Um, and we're having a look at how our state-based reporting arrangements fit in with that at the moment as we work through implementation for both our state plan and our role in implementation of that National Road Safety Action Plan. So in terms of key elements of the action plan, the action plan affirms um, and reflects the national vision of zero lives lost and zero serious injuries on our roads by 2050. Um, it also reaffirms um, the South Australian government commitment to road safety targets of fewer than 43 lives lost and 474 serious injuries by 2031. The action plan is also centred around themes. Um, as per the strategy, it is based around safe systems. And as I go through some of the specific actions against each theme um, in, the pre in today's presentation, you, you'll see that start to come out. Um, but in terms of the themes, they've, they've been very much structured around the priorities of the, of the new government, which had a, has had a strong focus around school safety in particular, um, as well as um, the things that have been highlighted as key importance, which we try to express it in a way that people who have a particular interest or area of concern can find out the actions that are happening that are relevant to them. So the focus on motorcyclists, for example, is an example of that, where there's particular safety considerations that applies to that cohort. So I mentioned monitoring and evaluation before. So the Road Safety Action Plan um, for the first time releases our well our safety performance indicators um, that we'll be applying um, here in SA. Um, to and, and the purpose of those indicators is to work out what's working well and what's not. So it's, it, are all of our activities collectively turning the dial where we want it to go or is there a different approach needed? Um, and also to provide that transparency around what's happening on our road network um, and in our road safety system as I like to think about it. The other thing I should mention is that in terms of the indicators and I'll turn to what they all are in a moment, um, it also picks up those national reporting obligations in terms of um, in terms of the things that we're required to report nationally. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge CASA's in assistance in, in, in framing these indicators. So it's something that we reached out to CASA and they provided us some help with in, in putting them together. Uh, so in terms of the safety performance indicators, I won't go through each one, but I'll just touch on a few highlights. Um, so they do cover key areas such as the different um, types of road user behaviour. So some people talk about the fatal five, so tracking that. Um, the safety of our road safety infrastructure, including tracking and reporting on improvements to road risk ratings over time. Um, vehicle age um, and, and how that's tracking is one of the um, kind of key, key factors around road safety being the age of a vehicle. We also have performance indicators um, that are around um, tracking road safety outcomes for particular cohorts. So Aboriginal road users, for example, are overrepresented in our safety statistics. Um, so it's been identified as a priority to put in place an indicator around that. Um, in saying that, I should also mention that for some of these indicators, we can report on them now which is fantastic. And that's the case for most of them. I'm looking at Tim, I can't remember the exact percentage. I think it's about 70% of them um, off the top of my head, but there's somewhere being able to put in place that reporting capability um, and Aboriginal road users is an example of that, is a project in and of itself to work out how we're going to source that data um, in a way that um, enables it to be reported on. So before I move on to the different um, actions that we've got against each theme, I'll just pause to see if there's any questions. Yes. Hi. Quite a few questions. Sure. Um, I guess mainly ones of concern for me are the, you know, walking, cycling ones. Mm. And I'm just a bit concerned that they're probably probably not hitting the mark in terms of what they're asking, like the percentage of roads to separate a cycle lane. Yeah. Um, or A, there's one that's 
everything in above, and that doesn't align with the space system outcome. So I guess we, that is one thing. And then how do we know what we're aiming for? Because we don't have a network which says what roads should have cycling of a certain level of service. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what we're heading towards, what percentage we're aiming for. And also, yeah, I guess I'll just raise that as a concern. But then um, I guess the question for today is, um, I guess how how will councils be um, I guess also accountable to any, looking at ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to ask the councils to provide this information year on year? Which I would say, you know, thumbs up. Like, yes, we that will make us more accountable. It will obviously place some responsibility on you know council by council as well um, on our roads and then obviously arterial roads. So are these reflecting on both local and council roads and how how are we all going to be accountable? Sure, and it's a very good question. In terms of the um, indicator around um, a posted speed limit of 50 kilometres an hour or more on a separated cycleway, um, just uh, I think a lot of that comes down to, and there's lots of different understandings about what a separated cycleway is um, and what we think of as being a separated cycleway isn't necessarily the same in other Australian jurisdictions. Um, and I, in saying that, um, this is a national indicator that we're required to report on under the National Road Safety Action Plan, um, which is why we've sort of, it's a good example of how what we've done at a state level is then gone, well, for us, we'd also like to track any improvement, which is why we've got that general indicator around share of roads with a separated cycle path. But again, we're working through the, the definitions in terms of what the Commonwealth's expectations are and at a state level. Um, but my working assumption has been that um, at this stage, um, at least for Tier 1, we'd be looking to report on dip roads only. Um, and I'm really excited to hear um, that the City of Adelaide is thinking in this space, um, but also really conscious of um, the resource constraints that apply to councils um, that can make it difficult for some councils um, to take on additional responsibilities and, and reporting burdens. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, any other questions around the indicators? Yes, at the back and then here. Well, I see that there is quite a few performance indicators related to uh, safety technologies for vehicles. Yeah. But I don't see anything related to ITS. Uh, so intelligent transport technology systems. Yeah. Um, is that made of purpose or? Yeah, so in terms of ITS, um, the department is involved in some work nationally to look at use road safety use cases around ITS. Um, and yeah, I'd be interested to chat with you offline around how you see it playing a role in road safety outcomes, for sure. It'd be good to talk it through. Yeah. And here? Yeah, um, firstly, I was involved in the study that some of the research for this a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And so I'm really pleased to see this because we did find correlations between a lot of those parameters and safety outcomes in all the jurisdictions. Simple question is, will these be um, reported each year? Or will Correct. That's right. Where um, so um, at this stage, I'm expecting they'll be reported on the Think Road Safety website. So the Think Road Safety website's the home for the strategy and the action plan. I should, probably should have mentioned that at the start if anyone wants to download a copy. Um, and yes, so we'll be looking to put in place a online dashboards that enable reporting around these indicators. Yep. And at the back over there. There are actually targets associated with these indicators. So if, I, if I looked at any signalised intersections in the speed limit, does it seem to actually know what the number is? And is there a kind of a by such and such? We're trying to not have traffic it's seventy. You know, is there actual targets associated with it? Yeah. So where um an an indicator is a national indicator, so signalised intersections is an example of that. There is an associated national target, um, but we haven't gone down the path of setting targets for our specific state-based indicators. Um, rather, we've got the overall targets to reduce lives lost and serious injuries. Any more questions? Okay, no one on Teams, hand up. 
All right, we might keep going because I'm probably already going over time. So what I might do now is um, step through some of the um, key actions that we're doing against each um, each of our themes in the action plan over the next three years. Um, I won't go through all of them because we will run out of time. But that said, um, if people have um, ones that they'd particularly like to talk through that I haven't covered, feel free to jump in. So in terms of schools and local places, um, some of the, um, the key actions that we're doing at the moment are around um, trialling a school precinct approach in Port Lincoln and nice to see the Way to Go team represented here today. Um, and, um, and the idea of that is to um, explore the existing approach that's used where the Way to Go team works with schools and see how we can extrapolate that out to cover a wider precinct approach around um, enabling safer travel to and, to and from school and active transport. Um, smart school zone trials. So um, the one that DRT is most involved with is at Lenswood, um, but there's also a couple of council run trials at Charles Sturt and Wakery councils. Um, the action plan also confirms the South Australian government's ongoing commitment to the Way to Go program and to bicycle education. And I think somebody mentioned speed limit measures earlier in the um, session. Um, so uh, just to confirm that around speed management, um, some of the key early actions um, that are underway um, is a review of speed limits on beaches. So there was a consultation that via the Your Say website that recently concluded um, seeking feedback around what speed management settings should apply in a beach environment, um, because beaches, unbeknownst to me until a year or so ago, are actually a road related area. Um, and so normal speed management type settings apply. Um, and the other is to mention um, a review of the speed limit guidelines for South Australia um, to um, apply the movement and place approach. And I'm guessing, um, given the road safety background of people in the room, people be familiar with the movement and place concept. I'm seeing lots of people nodding. Um, and, and, and that then provides guidance around um, setting speed limits on, on local council roads in particular. Um, so that they're just a couple of highlights that are more bringing out that local places concept and also road safety in a metropolitan context. Yes. Fantastic. It's going to change the future, hopefully, in terms of behaviour change. That's where we want to be. So that's awesome and great to see some numbers against these actions. But I'm just wondering about the 200,000. Is that missing as your? So that's the existing level of commitment, um, funding commitment that the Way to Go team has um, around infrastructure. So in practice, um, the way that works is we partner with local, the relevant local council on a, is it 50-50 basis? Yeah, on a 50-50 basis um, to do um, treatments around school zones, for example. Um, yes, small but mighty. <laughs> Uh, yep, hand up the back. Sorry, I don't know if there's more after this that you're asking questions about. I'm like, no, that's fine. We can take questions as we go along. Just yeah. regarding movement place. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone in the room knows what movement place means, but what like the council that don't. Okay. Um, you know, some are fairly catching up with functional road hierarchy, let alone considering movement in place and the road transport strategies and things like that. Is there any thought about, I guess, State's input into movement in place because I don't think there's a movement in place guide or strategy or something that applies. That's really that's really useful feedback. Um, and one of the things that we've got as an action is around um, local counts working with local councils to identify what their capacity building and other needs are. Um, so I think what you're flagging is a is a need from a local government perspective. Um, so that's really helpful for us in terms yeah, of that action. Place itself, and actually having something in place, other sort of structure that's not just addressed based on road safety. Yeah, that's right. So I think um, movement in place is something that's called out in the national road safety strategy, and we. We've picked it up at a state level and as you say it's a, a, a useful framework for having a conversation with local communities about 
their environment and what they want it to look like, including road management settings. Yeah, agree. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering if the review is wider than actually be wider than your local place. Yeah, it's it's not limited to local places, no. Um, so I think um, it sits alongside some some national actions. So there's some national actions around, for example, the default speed limit. Um, so things like that are being looked at nationally rather than being looked at at a state level. Um, for example, um, which is why I guess we, we're thinking that it's, it is more localised, but that's not to say that wider issues aren't, aren't in scope where it's not being dealt with under a national process. Yeah. Okay, we might keep going. Oh, there's more school and local places. I thought I'd covered all of it. Um, so um, perhaps just to pick up on... Um, uh, the local government piece that we were talking about earlier. Um, so yes, um, for local councils, one of our um, early kind of our first port of call, if you like, bearing in mind that it's kind of almost a, a to-do list and a rolling action plan, and this will evolve over time, is to really have a conversation with local councils about what the issues are from their perspective and what their needs are, um, and appreciating also that local councils are not uniform, uh, both in terms of their practical situation, but also their capabilities and level of interest in road safety. Um, so yes, one of the things that we're looking to kick off as a, as a first step is some engagement with local councils um, to help inform what this action plan should look like in the local government space going forward. Okay, I might move on to public transport, cycling and walking. Um, so in terms of the actions that are captured, um, there is some ongoing work um, via our um, department, um, including the South Australian Public Transport Authority, to look at how we can get more people back into public transport. Um, and that's reflected as an action in the action plan as an area of focus for the department. Um, the, um, the other key actions reflected here are around um, a continued rollout of um, infrastructure improvements to improve pedestrian and cyclist safety, um, and also consultation with privately owned personal mobility device users. So when I say personal mobility device, that includes e-scooters, um, as well as consultation with the broader community. Um, and that consultation commenced on Monday. Um, so if people are interested in providing feedback, um, there's an online survey available via the Your Say website. Um, so that is underway. In terms of motorcyclists, um, this is a, a cohort that has been an area of focus um, for the department for, for a while now, um, with the changes to graduated licensing being implemented. I lose track of the years. I think it was last year that it started. Um, in terms of what next, um, uh, it is around um, continuing to look at um, where we need motorcycle focused safety treatments on key corridors. Um, uh, the, involvement in a national review of um, the learner approved motorcycle scheme. So that's something we've been working with Ostroads on, which is now completed. So we get our action plan done. We've already done an action, which I'm very happy. Um, uh, as well as looking at how we can enhance our rider safe training program um, to improve learning outcomes. And that's something where we're looking at what's happening in other states and territories to help inform that. I mentioned uh, Aboriginal road users um, before as a cohort that's also overrepresented in our road safety statistics. Um, so we are looking at um, um, prevention and diversionary programs um, to improve both road user behaviour and reduce overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the criminal justice system. And that's something that's being progressed as part of the government's broader work and involvement in closing the gap um, and that national framework. Um, on the right track, um, continuing and expanding, um, as well as their role in child strength installation in remote regions. Um, and as I touched on, um, one of the um, 
areas of focus for us is to improve our data collection and analysis around Aboriginal road safety, and we've been progressing some work on that. Um, yeah. Keep going. Road user behaviour. Um, so, and I think Rob, Rob raised a, a question around that earlier. Um, so in terms of road user behaviour, um, communications a range of communications activities, um, including the continuation of the Think Road Safety Partnership Program. Um, and I think this is a good example of how the action plan and the strategy fit together, because uh, the action plan identifies certain priorities um, to focus on in terms of communication and communication effort, where, where education is going to make a difference and um, uh, interactions with heavy vehicles being an example, and I think we'll come to light vehicles a bit later. Um, so the, the idea is that our communications activities um, very much focus around the things that the um, road safety strategy identified as a priority. Um, the other thing um, that we're working on behind the scenes is a policy development piece and um, with having a bit of a deep dive at drink and drug driving and what sorts of measures or additional measures might be needed um, to bring about changes in road user behaviour in that space. So always interested to hear people's ideas on that. And then in terms of other things that are happening around road user behaviour. Um, as I think most people who watch TV news would know, we are rolling out mobile phone detection cameras. So there's a technology trial um, currently underway where we're trialling two different types of camera technology um, on South Road um, to help inform the rollout of mobile phone detection cameras across metropolitan Adelaide um, from early next year. Um, and at the same time, also looking at distraction as an issue uh, in terms of what other measures might be needed. Um, and that's uh, driver distraction of, of sort of the typical road user behaviours. Recognising that it's dangerous to rely on a short period of statistics is the one that's been biggest so far this year. Um, the other dimension is the role of South Australia Police uh, in terms of both the the perceived risk of detection and targeting dangerous road users. And in terms of a policy development piece, and again, the need to focus on this is reinforced by our statistics so far this year, um, is to develop initiatives around older road users um, so that the team's been busy working on putting together a package of um, recommendations, if you like, um, for what, what can be done to improve road safety outcomes for that cohort. And finally, in terms of road user behaviour, um, the other things that we're working on is um, after that focus on um, the graduated licensing scheme for light vehicles over many years, um, having a look at the training side and, and whether there are things that need to be done to further help improve um, the competency of our novice drivers from a driver training perspective. Um, the other action we've got in here is um, around the rollout of the ultra high powered vehicle license class, um, which will apply for people who are driving certain high end sports cars. It's a very small subset of the vehicle fleet um, from late next year. How am I going for time? 40 minutes in. Don't need to go. Okay. Well, I will keep going like this if it's working for people. No one's got up and walked out, so I'll, I'll continue. <laughs> um, so in terms of the other areas of focus, um, one that I think I can see some real opportunities to deliver some really great outcomes um, in terms of improvements to road safety is around road safety in the workforce. Um, so um, working with Safe Work SA um, and um, also nationally, um, so we met with um, Monash University around clocks A the other week, um, looking at putting putting in place a package of measures to help build that culture of road safety in organisations um, and, and make sure that those safe work practices are embedded um, in, for those organisations that regularly have people out on the road. Um, in, interesting space with changes in work practices that have happened organically with recent events, um, So, but still an area where there's lots of opportunity to have an impact. 
Um, and in terms of regional and remote, as per the strategy, um, it is an area of focus um, because of that over-representation of lives lost and serious injuries on our regional network. Um, so some of the key activities um, that are underway um, are the development of a network safety plan. I can see a nod in the room from one person who knows all about it. Um, which And the idea of that is that gives us our priority list. Uh, in terms of where we should be um, investing money next um, to deliver road safety infrastructure improvements. Um, so, uh, and, and you would have seen, hopefully, some of that materialise uh, in terms of the road safety, Commonwealth State Government Road Safety Stimulus Program, which saw mass action treatments on a number of priority regional corridors in South Australia. Um, some of the other things we're doing is we are currently rolling out a package of road safety infrastructure treatments in the Adelaide Hills, um, which is very dear to my heart, being an Adelaide Hills girl myself, um, as well as um, uh, looking at um, a, rest, a rest area strategy for light and heavy vehicles. Some of the other work um, that the department's been doing is um, uh, area planning studies. So I've most recently been involved in one for the for the far west region. So these studies look at um, not just um, and anyone who's been involved in a local government planning process would have had a similar experience. It's not not just road safety, but a range of sort of issues and levers from a regional planning perspective. Um, but really interesting to see how the issues are quite different when you get to remote areas uh, in terms of road safety and the things that are of concern to communities um, and also uh, in terms of road crash stats when you do a drive on the, the crash factors um, that they come out quite different to straight regional um, so some good learnings there. Um, we're also um, looking to have a focus around um, capacity building um, so again really grateful to the college for hosting today it's a, it's a good start. <laughs> um, uh, as well as um, uh, some work that's happening in the road safety space, um, which I'm quite excited around. Um, so one of the ways that um, we've thought about both the strategy and the action plan is that um, we don't have buckets of money, unfortunately. Um, so part of it is about how can we be smarter with what we have? So an example of that is some of the work that's happening in the road maintenance space at the moment to make sure that the road safety priorities are evidence-based in terms of if something's identified as a priority from for road maintenance for road safety reasons that has a good evidence base around it. I think I touched on heavy vehicles briefly before, but um, in terms of key actions, um, SA is really actively involved in the national work around heavy vehicle driver competency. And part of the reason behind that is the it is the um, concern around the southeastern freeway down track. So for those who don't know, there were a series of roundtables held um, over the course of last year um, with key heavy vehicle stakeholders as well as key road safety stakeholders like CASA and um, the RAA um, to work out um, to identify solutions to what's quite a specific issue around the, the operation of the intersection at the bottom of the down track of the freeway. Um, and heavy vehicle competency was one of the things that was really highlighted as being an issue, not just there, but more broadly needing to be an area of focus. Um, and we're also continuing to contribute to the development of the Heavy Vehicle National Law Review, um, which is an ongoing review that's being led by um, the National Transport Commission. In terms of vehicles and technology, um, and this is an area where um, I think um, has a modelling that helps support the strategy, really highlights the role that ve vehicle technology improvements and reducing the age of our vehicle fleet can play in, in delivering road safety outcomes. But in the context of this being the start, it's really about we're working out how best to do that um, in terms of what's, what's an effective model for helping to deliver that outcome. Um, and so if people have any ideas around that, I'd, I'd love to hear about them um, because, yeah, it's an area where um, we're exploring because you can see the possibilities, um, but the solutions aren't as easily identified. Um, the other thing we're working on is um, as part of the broader national process around the safe deployment of automated vehicles. So that's a national um, 
piece of work that again has been led by the National Transport Commission that we're actively involved in um, with the target of having the framework in place by I think to date the timeline's been 2026 which is not feeling very far away and um, the state government also affirming our commitment to continue to fund ANCAP and the Used Car Safety Rating Program. I think I, I mentioned to comms and vehicles before um, in the context of while we're looking for other solutions in the meantime it was a question of what can we usefully do um, so we have um, through our consultation and some of the targeted surveys and other work that we did in, in developing the road safety strategy it was identified that it's younger and older drivers that tend to have older cars um, so they were identified as priority co cohorts from a communications perspective um, to um, it's um, both in terms of um, getting the message out there that um, it, you know that think about the car that you, you're getting into whether it's the car that you buy or the car that you choose for an individual trip um, and the other um, thing that's a work in progress is development of a website that explains the used car safety ratings. Um, and that's something that we're looking at with other states and territories um, rather than each of us going off and doing our own thing. Um, but we do have updated used car safety ratings accessible via our My Licence website, I think it is. In the meantime, if anyone wants to have a look. And finally, uh, in terms of research and data, um, so affirming um, that the South Australian government will continue to fund road safety research and very happy that um, we've continued our partnership with, with the Centre for Automotive Safety Research for, for three years, um, which is great news. Um, we're also developing an online data portal um, to improve accessibility to South Australia's road safety statistics. Um, as well as working to put in place data sharing agreements to help enable um, information sharing around road crash data. So recognising that, you know, the way that we share and talk about road safety data needs to be done in a sensitive way, particularly if it's drilling down to an individual level, um, trying to find that balance um, because to me it's sort of the more that data gets used to inform decision making, whether it's by DIT, safe part or local councils, the better really. Um, so it, it's about how we can help to make that happen. Um, and finally, I touched on local governments in terms of being a, a conversation around what councils need. I'm really interested to hear from local councils around what their data requirements are um, and to the extent they're, they're being met or not being met by the department. And that's it for me in terms of the actions in the action plan. Um, so now over to the rest of the group in terms of any other questions that you have. Number of intersections that speed limit around 70 kilometers speed limit. So like, you know, they have said that they won't create any new signalized intersection about ID in future. Just like we've got a policy on level crossing that we won't be creating another uh, level crossing. It will be a great set. So are we looking forward to have something like that in future? Like not now, but like are we planning to have something on the lines of other sites? Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Um, and yeah, keen to have a chat with you offline I mean, about what that would look like. Yeah. So why don't we make that as a bit of a follow up from today? Yeah. Talks about data analysis or and that liaison with SAFOL. Has there been any discussion about trying to get even live data almost to that extent? But, you know, the most recent data we have is obviously quite, you know, not recent, like in terms of it's not today. Uh, yeah. Maybe from 2021. Obviously, I understand there's a bit of data entry associated with that which causes some of the lag times, but is there any thought into how that system works and how to improve it? Sure, I think I think there's a couple of things in there. In terms of live today for Lives Lost, one of the things that we will say, like for, for SAPOL, their role is to tell family members and things like that. So they need to make sure that's happened um, before things can come out in statistics. It's very much their yeah, yeah. view. Um, but in terms of um, when we've got our final stats 
and close out the books and say these are the statistics for 2022, for example, um, the, the road crash data portal that I touched on, that's very much part of what we're planning to, what we're hoping to get as an outcome of that process, is that as well as it, data being more readily available, it's more timely. Maybe at the back and then at the front. Yeah. Um, first, thank you for the presentation. My underlying question is around is there a process of identifying the actions which come to the top of the list? And by that, I mean there's a, there's a bunch in there. Some of them, in respect, have a soft link to road safety outcomes. And then there's others which you kind of like, yeah, we must absolutely get into them. So, what's the process of that? bringing the cream to the top, as we were, to really focus on the stuff that matters. Yeah, and so I think it would be fair to say that um, I agree with you. So in terms of the Road Safety Action Plan, it incorporates actions that I guess have been identified if we look at our road safety strategies priorities as being um, key, key enabling activities, some of them. Um, or areas that the statistics tell us need to be an area of focus, um, the drug and alcohol and older road users projects both being an example of that. Um, but it does also reflect priority areas that from a statistical point of view may not necessarily be the biggest thing, but nonetheless will still deliver some road safety outcomes. Um, in terms of the process, um, so um, South Australia does have a, a road user safety advisory committee um, that will be in, involved in the um, in in the development of each or the update of each action plan each year um, to help inform what those priorities are. Yeah. Yeah. I guess further to that, I mean, some of the previous stuff I've read, I'm cool. So best practice places like Sweden or England or. One of the biggest factors in their just rural local paddle crash rate was they had a program to uh, separate with fire barriers a lot of their long lengths of rural highway. Mm. And it kind of about two or four thousand bits per day in Sweden. And I think they, they set out on about a 20 year program, like a million or 200 million per year, 20 years eventually they'll finish separating more. Um, I guess it, and they've achieved about halving their crash rate doing that. Um, seems to be very hard in a rural state with a lot of regional serious crashes. We're going to get to zero unless we just think similar. Um, is there any thought about moving to a program like that in the future? So um, one of the indicators um, you you would have seen potentially um, was a, is around um, getting our high volume regional roads to three stars or better. Um, yeah, and that correlates to an, a national target so I think it would be fair to say that that is an area of focus in terms of high volume roads to get them to three stars. So that may not necessarily mean wire rope barriers, but collectively kind of getting there, isn't it? And and I guess it's a question of with a, a very big road network here in South Australia and an even bigger local government road network, what that optimal mi mix of road safety treatments is. Um, so I know that so in recent times, um, there's been a really strong focus on shoulder sealing, audio tactile line marking. I can see Amit nodding at me, um, for example, as things that deliver quite a material benefit um, in terms of our what our evaluations tell us, but we can get it on a big stretch of road. Um, and uh, I'm going to Western Australia later this year, um, and I'd be really interested. I know that they've done a lot of work to think about this sim in, in a Western Australian context, which it's not that far away from us, really, once you head west of Adelaide. Um, and I'm really interested to see um, what they've come up with in terms of an optimal mix um, for, for, for our regional network. Mm. Ah, Rob, do we, Jamie, can I ask you to let Rob speak? Sure. <laughs> let Rob speak. Here we go. Uh, there you go, Rob. Uh, okay. Uh, why have targets? Why not do as much as possible or as soon as possible? In the past, we've, we've always made, we've missed the targets. So why have them? So just for those who couldn't hear, um, Rob, I'll just let the rest of the room know your question, if that's okay. Yes. Um, 
And so the question was, why have targets? Um, they're not achieved, so so why have them? Um, as much as possible, for as soon as possible. I think in an ideal world, Rob, I'd, I'd love to have as much as possible as soon as possible. And in some ways, I think that that's what the long-term vision of zero lives lost and serious injuries reflects um, in, in the action plan and in the strategy. Um, that the idea is that ultimately what we'll move towards is is zero. Um, and there's some interesting work being undertaken by Osroads at the moment to work through just that. What does zero look like in an Australian context and what's the pathway to get there? OK, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, question at the back and then here. <clears throat> Risk there that um, without some sort of further explanation or guidance or something that uh, and people will look at that and say, well, there's not a lot of for, for us to spend your local government to do. So um, I, just want, I just wonder about that. Yeah, it's a it's. Yeah, it, I guess that the strategy and the action plan were developed to um, identify what governments, what activities state government agencies need to do um, rather than binding local governments. Um, and I, I, yeah, I guess it's an interesting question in terms of whether um, local councils see the need for um, some common kind of activities or actions that are needed um, at a state level for local councils. Um, it was something um, that was difficult to land in the context of the national strategy, um, which did involved ALGA as part of that process, in part because the situation of local councils are very, is quite varied. Um, but there is some work that's been published by the Local Government Association that sets out um, if, a, if a council is wanting to develop its own action plan on road safety um, for its council area, how it can go about doing that, um, which is which is a very good resource. Yes. Obviously been a lot of crashes, but Kensington Road probably really comes to mind in terms of not seeing the safe system approach come through in a response from government. And I think it reflects Sadly, on our profession, and I, I feel the pressure personally. Um, you know, there was a lot of media. The whole response from ministers was, you know, well, oh, this the driver, the driver. We're going to do driver behaviour campaigns, but we know the safe system. People are going to continue to do the wrong things. We have a responsibility to look at the other pillars of the safe system. You know, such as speed. So, how do we get an action plan? How does a document, a strategy? start to talk to all of us and talk to the decision makers to say like you know it's putting in place everything but we have to like you know look at those hard things and look at that whole system like how do we actually make it change the way we think rather than just do report the crash that as you know driving attention and then you know do a driver campaign but then not look holistically yeah it's interesting because I guess um, for that particular location, um, there was an investigation carried out by the department. It's interesting, it hasn't been reported more in the media, but yeah, just to confirm that um, DIT staff who um, routinely go out and investigate crash locations to see if there are issues with how the infrastructure is working have gone out to have a look at that site um, to make sure things are all as it should be. Um, yeah, it's a, um, it's 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 um, it's quite unusual in that there have, hasn't been previous um, incidents at that site, because one of the first things we did is have a look at the crash stats when that recent crash was reported. Um, but yeah, that's not to say that we're not having a look. Um, and similarly at the um, uh, the location of the recent um, cycling um, crash on Flagstaff Hill. Yeah. I might leave it there due to time. If I may, then I'll, I'll ask one last question. I'm in charge. Um, <laughs> is, is, is the idea that this, I can't remember how many were, 42 actions? 63. 63. Thanks, Courtney. Wow. <laughs> they're going to be delivered in the three years, or is this a, a list for the whole strategy? 
Uh, this is a list for the three years. Okay. So yep. This is a three year list. Yep. Okay. And then annually you'll tweak things will go on and things will come off. Okay. That's right. Fantastic. That's a lot to do. Yeah. And I think what you'll find is some of the actions in the first one, so that one on um, vehicle safety as an example, that first pick a piece of work should inform what we need to do next. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Gary. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of other sessions lined up already. We've been very busy in the background, so please keep an eye out for that in future. Um, otherwise, please enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.